Hello, and welcome to the SANS webcast's Introduction to Windows Memory Analysis. I am A.J. Boyle, and I will be moderating the course today. The instructor is Chad Tilbury. Before I turn the time over to him, I would like to cover features of the interface for those who have not attended a SANS webcast before. The screen is split up into three main regions, the participants list, the direct message chat window, and the whiteboard, which has already been loaded. The participants list has several columns. The first with the little hand indicates someone has raised their hand to ask a question. To raise your hand, click the hand button right below the participants list. The next column is a yes-no indicator. You can click the toolbar button with the green check or the red X to indicate a yes or no answer to a question from a moderator or the instructor. The next column is the microphone. If this icon has a yellow background, someone is talking. The microphone will be locked so only one person can speak at a time. If you have a turn to speak, you can click the microphone button in the audio section. Do note that the Illuminate software will buffer speech. So if you experience network delays, playback will speed up, causing a chipmunk effect. The next column is the chat indicator. Anyone who is typing in the messaging entry box will have a yellow background here. I will cover how messaging works in a moment. The next column with the pin icon is the whiteboard editing indicator. I have disabled whiteboard editing for participants. The last icon before names is application sharing, which has also been disabled for participants. Finally, the list of names you see are your classmates, moderators, and the instructor who is also a moderator. Let me explain how the messaging system works. To enter a message, point your cursor at the entry box below the main window. Before sending, use the drop-down to select who the message will go to. Valid choices are all participants, only moderators, and only selected participants. You can select the names of other students, the instructor, or moderators to send a message only to that person. But do note that moderators will see all messages, both public and private. As mentioned, the whiteboard already has the slides loaded. The instructor will advance the slides as he moves through the course material, and it will automatically advance for all students. If you experience technical difficulties during the class, please send an email to webcast-support at sans.org or notify your moderator. Thank you for your attention. Now let me turn the mic over to your instructor, Chad Tilbury. Hello, everybody. Hey, I actually have two computers going, so I'm uh, <laughs> trying to manipulate both my keyboards and mouses at the same time. We'll see if I can uh, get this uh, <laughs> this uh, hack situation going a little bit here. Let me know. Give me a, a thumbs up or a hand clap or something if you can hear me okay. Very good. Thank you very much. See a few of you. Fantastic. Well, I've got uh, I've, I've hacked the system a little bit because I've got a presentation that has a, an intense amount of animations in it, and I'm, I'm hoping I'll be able to to use that. Uh, I realize that uh, given the fact that we're going across the undersea cables for many of you, it, it may not be uh, <laughs> the best option, but we'll see how it works out. And uh, as long as uh, everyone keeps happy, I'll, I'll stick to this. Otherwise, we can jump back down to the kind of cached version of the slides. Uh, before I get too deep, I do want to mention, and hopefully you noticed when you came into the webcast, that there was a link to download the PDF of these slides. So worst case, grab that PDF, you can follow along um, in that way. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on introductions, but I do want to say thanks to AISA for getting the word out and sponsoring this webcast. Looks like we have a great showing here. Uh, I have to admit that I would probably prefer to be in, in Australia giving this presentation in person, but uh, well, it saved me a long plane flight anyway. And I see I have uh, quite a bit of uh, friends I've seen before on here, so hello to you and hello to, to any new friends uh, in the making. One thing I do like to point out is that feel free to ask questions as we go along and as well as shouting answers out to the, uh, to the chat room. That's probably the best place to do it. I'll be keeping track of what's going on in the chat room. That's actually why I have two computers up and running and so I can watch that, that chat uh, kind of uh, at a good pace. Now, 
as I said, memory, uh, <laughs> memory forensics is actually one of my favorite topics, and I'm, I'm very happy to be able to kind of present this to you all tonight. I won't spend a whole lot of time on introducing myself, but I got my start in the, in the Air Force with the, an organization called the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And it's done a, a wide variety of, of different for, forensic type of, of cases, but really my specialty is in incident response as well as counter espionage. I currently serve as a incident response consultant. And I've spent my time over the last few years doing a large number of cases for everything from small to medium sized businesses all the way up to Fortune 500 companies uh, facing things like uh, a lot of our banking uh, theft hacks or APT type intrusions. I won't surprise you, I'm also a SANS uh, instructor. And I want to just point out that I, I have my contact information here. So if you have any questions or, or comments or war stories to share, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. I'd love to, love to hear from you. So we've got a lot to cover tonight. The first thing is why do we care about memory forensics? And over the last decade or so that I've been doing forensics, I haven't seen anything close to the value of a technique uh, like memory forensics. It's, it's raged onto the scene, really starting around 2006 time period, and I believe it has made a revolutionary change over well, what's available to us in, in a large number of investigations. Now, a lot of what we'll be covering today is going to be focusing a little more on kind of the intrusion type investigations or malware uh, type of cases that you may be running, uh, but just keep in mind, memory forensics is so important because memory is the really the, the, the critical choke point that we see on a computer system. It is the bridge that everything passes through from, from the disk all the way up to CPU. So we can get virtually anything out of memory from the standard uh, URLs or web traffic uh, that might have been going on in the system to open network sockets to, in some cases, uh, complete copies of registry keys and values, a large amount of information on hardware configuration. You can be able to find things like what USB keys or removal devices may have been placed on that system. One of the really interesting places of research that's going on in memory forensics is this idea of, of passwords, particularly as we get into the world of full disk encryption or encrypted volumes, where we may actually need to go back to a memory image in order to get that information. And of course, the final thing that I've got up here is this idea of malware. Um, and malware uh, is really probably easiest to find in a memory image. If, if I had one object or one artifact to actually look for to identify a system that's been infected with malware, I would almost certainly pick the memory image. Now I'm going to drop out for a second so I can get my pointer set up here. Give me one moment. Well, this, these slides that we're going to be talking about are really about doing the analysis, but I didn't want to uh, sweep by and not cover kind of the most critical part of, of doing memory analysis, which is really the idea of first we have to get our memory image. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it uh, during this hour. I did want to point out one of the newer tools that's come out uh, regarding uh, memory image. Did anyone actually use this tool? called Dump It from Moon Souls. The reason why I pointed out is because it is by far the easiest memory acquisition tool you're going to run across. It literally has no options. Wherever you run it from, it will show you what, how much memory you have to dump. It will ask if you want to continue, and it will just dump it to the same location that you ran the application from. It's a fantastic application to throw on a USB thumb drive and maybe deploy throughout your environment or give your instant responders. Literally all you have to do is walk up to a system that's up and running, plug the thumb drive in, run one executable, it'll dump the memory image back to the thumb drive, and then send it back for analysis. So really, really neat tool. 
freely available from the Moon Souls uh, website. Now this is really an introduction to memory analysis. We could get really deep in the weeds, and this slide is, uh, is what I call the, the one slide <laughs> kind of down and dirty, in that while we don't really need to understand a lot of these objects in order to use some of the new tools uh, that have recently come out in the, in the memory analysis realm, I really hate to have anyone actually running a tool without at least knowing what's happening underneath the hood. I think that's a critical thing. We just don't want people punching buttons. We really want you to kind of understand what we're seeing and why we're seeing it. So while I don't want to go into the depth that you need, say, to bring up Win Debug and start parsing memory yourself, I do want to just cover just a, a couple of the key artifacts or pieces of memory analysis uh, that we'll be taking advantage of. One of the, one of the things that really spurred me to make this presentation is the fact that now we finally have some incredibly robust, incredibly easy to use memory forensic tools that make all of these or, or give us access to all of these objects now in a, in a very nice, easy to use interface, unlike we've ever had before. So we no longer have to necessarily drop into Windy Bug to see this, but we should at least know kind of what we're looking at. So the first thing we have to do when we get our memory image is we have to find some context. We have to be able to tell where all the other objects are. And that, that usually entails finding some sort of an artifact or a kernel reference that allows us to then trace to the other memory structures that we're going to be interested in. In Windows, the most popular thing to find is this idea of a kernel processor control region, the KPCR. Now this was relatively easy to find in the XP days in that it was at a fixed address within memory. Once we got into Vista Windows 7 2008 world, all of a sudden it started moving. And some of you may be familiar with address space layer uh, randomization. Well, that actually affected our memory analysis tools as well. And that's why when we, uh, we get down to uh, seeing the various tools that we can use, You'll notice that there's a wide gap between operating systems that different tools actually support. Some of that is because every operating system, even every service pack, uh, may actually confuse or make it difficult to find a good reference point and actually be able to go and pull out all of the other memory structures we care about. So the first thing we do is find context. Once we find that context, we can Picking back off of that in order to identify critical things that we care about. One of the most critical is going to be this idea of an executive process block, or the idea of finding the running processes that, that were in that memory image. Those running processes will then allow us to find what we call the process environment block, which is going to show us the loaded DLLs or loaded libraries for that process. We'll also be able to then parse what we call the VAD tree. That VAD tree keeps track of all the memory pages or memory sections that are that belong to that process. And then there's a lot of other artifacts that we'll see as we go through here. Things like file handles, uh, for instance, or threads. But also the final thing that we really want to focus on is the idea of these kernel modules, or the ability to kind of patch the kernel. We commonly uh, will see these as drivers. And of course, our memory analysis tools will need to go and pull those uh, the information of those kernel modules out so we can identify which drivers have been loaded so we can see if maybe any malicious ones uh, may be uh, part of the problem on that system. The next step after we identify where all our key components of, of memory are is to really kind of dig deep. Now, we could probably do a standard memory analysis just with steps one and two, but if we're investigating kind of more advanced malware, uh, we're going to see that advanced malware can take steps to hide itself, even in memory. Uh, we're going to see that it's, uh, it's almost trivially easy for malware to unlink itself from the process list, or unlink DLLs, so they, they won't be identified as being loaded in a specific process. So we're going to need to, again, find kind of uh, key signatures for all those memory structures, and our memory analysis tools are then just going to simply search all of memory for any kind of outliers that are out there, bring them up, allow us to uh, kind of include those in our analysis. And then the final piece will be for us to, uh, of course, then use our brains. That'll be pulling all this information together, hopefully in a nice, user-friendly uh, way, so that we can very quickly parse through uh, an intense amount of data, uh, looking for kind of the key piece which will help us solve what happened on that system. So 
So if you are familiar with standard forensics, you think of our file system. Standard forensics very often is uh, concerned about file systems. And of course, the key things in a file system are files. And so we spend a lot of time concentrating on allocated files, unallocated files, metadata about files. If you want to take that analogy into the world of memory analysis, instead of files, think of processes. Processes are by far the most important structure within a, within a memory image. So one of the first things our tools are going to do are go out and find those executive process blocks. And they're going to look like this. Actually, the executive process blocks are tracked in memory in a doubly linked list. You see that we see sms.exe and lsas.exe and service host. You notice that there's a forward link and a back link to all of those. That's our doubly linked list that we simply find the start of and follow each link in order to identify all the processes running, or at least all the processes that haven't been somehow manipulated uh, by malware. And then I've blown up the lsas.exe just to really represent this idea that each one of those process blocks is going to have a wealth of information that we can use to identify whether it is legitimate or maybe evil. We'll see things like the process ID. We'll see what its parent was. We'll see where it was sitting in memory. We'll have timestamps associated with, with processes that can be very useful. In addition to a wealth of other things that, that you'll see shortly, like our DLLs uh, that are loaded and our threads that are, that are part of that process and handles to files or, or pieces of the registry uh, within Windows. But think of that process block as kind of a, uh, a structure that holds kind of all the information related. You can almost think of it as the metadata structure uh, around a uh, process. So as we go through this presentation, I'm going to introduce some of the, the newest kind of tools available. And I, I picked the freely available tools. Uh, primarily because that opens it up to the widest audience of you, able to go out and grab these and actually play with them. And the, the simple fact is, we are very lucky. The, the free memory analysis tools out there are really best of breed. And, and it's amazing the capabilities they give us. Uh, without these tools, like Redline, for instance, we'd literally be back in the Stone Age. We'd literally need individuals that, uh, <laughs> that can code an assembly and are complete Windows and Turtles experts to do memory analysis. However, with these tools, all of a sudden, they really open the field and allow uh, kind of uh, the rest of us who aren't, uh, who don't think in hex, to actually be able to do memory analysis. And I start with Redline because I think it is by far the, the easiest tool to actually use. It has the best interface, and it's a fantastic tool for really starting to learn what we can find in memory. It has the best support of any free uh, memory analysis tool in, you know, in conjunction with its kind of sister tool, which is called Memorize. We see that support for just about any memory image you're likely to run into, both 32-bit and 64-bit, which is kind of a neat distinction uh, with, uh, with this tool. Well, it's put out by a company called Mandia, and they do a lot of kind of instant response uh, type of work, and it's kind of built in a lot of these heuristics and, and ways of quickly identifying malware. And they also included kind of a, a quick and dirty walkthrough, almost like an idea of a step-by-step -step way uh, to identify what to look at first, and then what to look at uh, next to that. And in addition to being easy to use, it also has a great ability to kind of be extended. It has some built-in signatures, although I'll admit the number of signatures built in are, are quite small. But the nice thing is you can add your own. So as you find malware within your own environment, you can create signatures for that and continue to search for that in any additional memory analysis that you do in the future. So I highly recommend that you, you take a look at Redline if you haven't already. Its download address was at the bottom of that last slide. So once we start our memory analysis, very commonly we'll start by looking at processes. And when we're looking at processes, I'm starting to try to identify ones that just might not be right. I'm looking for the evil ones. So what we're, what we're seeing here on this slide is all of the things that you might consider looking at in order to identify the bad from the good. So for instance, what's the process called? Is that, is that something that you're used to seeing on that server product or that workstation? Is it even spelled correctly? Sometimes, as we'll see, a slight misspelling can help it kind of hide in plain sight. What path is it running from? 
If I see a binary running from something like Windows System 32, I'm probably going to uh, trust it a heck of a lot more than if I see a process running from the temp directory or under some sort of a user uh, app data folder or something along those lines. So just simply seeing where it was running from can help us identify maybe those outliers. Also identifying what process spawned it. Was it spawned by the proper process? And some of this comes with, with practice and knowledge and knowing, uh, for instance, that servicehost.exe processes are always spawned by the services.exe process. If you see one that's not spawned by services.exe, well, that's a problem. So being able to recognize kind of these patterns can really help us. We also get an ability to see what the, what the original command line that spawned that process was. We can see the arguments. We can see if it, if it makes sense, if it actually looks legitimate. And then the final thing that, that I see a lot of people kind of not pay as much attention to is this idea that every process has a timestamp associated with it. If we happen to get lucky enough to find a malicious process, that alone can be enough to help us blow open our case. Because all of a sudden, I have a malicious process and I have a start time. I know when it first appeared on that system. As such, I might be able to leverage that to then go to my file system analysis and start to identify everything else that happened around that time, or my event log, or my registry analysis, really tying all of these kind of, uh, individual artifacts with their own timestamp together and looking for things that happened about that same time. So start time can also be very, very helpful. So let's start with an example. So this is an example of a SOBIG worm. SOBIG worm spread through email attachments and network shares. And as you see on the left, we have Redline. And I've run Redline on a, a memory image that's been infected with SOBIT. We see along the bottom a list of processes. And then up top, on the, you see investigative steps. Those investigative steps are actually that guided analysis that I talked about. The idea of kind of being able to just walk through kind of a series of steps that will help you hopefully uh, identify uh, what shouldn't be on that system or identify whether uh, there's a cause to be concerned about whatever you're looking at. Now when we look at the processes, you'll notice that one, well actually two, are what we call redlined in that they have a red marker next to them. This means that they have a very high uh, what we call malware rating index meaning that the, the software believes that these are likely uh, to be malicious processes. Now, the memorize.exe turns out to be a, a legitimate process. That's actually the program I use to acquire that process. So if you see memorize.exe very commonly, that's going to be uh, the memory acquisition tool. It could also be something like dump it or win32db or MDD or whatever uh, memory dumping tool you typically use, you may see in here. And the reason why it actually gets redlined by the, by the tool is that if you think about how memory acquisition works, you need raw access to memory. And very commonly, the way you get that on our newer systems is to load a driver. So a driver has to be loaded. It has to be uh, loaded at the kernel level, and it gives raw access to an application. Now, that's very similar to what malware tries to do. As such, it kind of gets flagged along with kind of the other piece of malware, which actually turns out to be winppr32.exe. So if we didn't know that winppr32.exe was bad, we might look a little deeper uh, into it. And this is kind of the details page that we get when we click on a process. And just looking at this, with, since I have a little bit of experience, I can see all kinds of evil just on the process details here. I thought I had some arrows that would pop up. Well, first of all, we have our malware risk index of 100. Redline rates applications or processes from 0 to 100, with 100 being the most evil or, or the most likely to be malicious. So the fact that this has a 100 malware risk index all of a sudden uh, makes me think, hmm, at least Redline is fairly convinced that this is a bad process. Oops. Well, unfortunately, my, my pointer isn't coming up, but the the other items which would make me a little bit interested in this are, if you look at the path, notice that this executable is actually running from the Windows directory. That's not a guarantee that what we're looking at is malicious, 
but it's a little anomalous. Most of our processes are likely going to be running from the Windows System 32 directory. There are exceptions, of course. For instance, the explore.exe process runs from the Windows directory. But at a minimum, I see that and say, hmm, that's a, that's a little interesting. The other really key one that I would recognize is the SID. You notice the security identifier down there. Those of you that are, uh, are Windows jockeys uh, will see that that's actually a SID for a user uh, within a user context or a user security identifier. Now, of course, users can spawn processes and often do on systems, but at least I know now that if, if this process is purporting to be something like a system process, it's not, it doesn't have the right security identifier uh, to actually back that up. So that's another item that at least might tell me that, hmm, I might want to look a little deeper into this process. Now we have that big long list of, of processes and, and what to look inside or, or what to actually focus on when we're trying to identify uh, anomalous processes. But Redline actually thought of something pretty clever. He said, well, if we have all of these kind of rules of thumb, for instance, the fact that service host.exe should only be running for, uh, or only have a parent process of services.exe, or it should always be running from the Windows System 32 directory, or should always be running under the system context, not a user uh, security identifier context. We know all of these things. Why don't we just package those up and create something called a malware risk index? So it's a kind of a heuristic check that, that looks for a large number of things. It'll even look for items like command shells being spawned from specific processes as well as, if you're familiar with DLL, uh, load order hijacking. We'll also do some rudimentary checks for, for load order hijacking, which is kind of one of the newer uh, things we've seen kind of more advanced attackers use in order to very, very cleverly hide their malware. If you're not familiar with it, do a search for DLL load order hijacking. There's some, uh, some great blog entries on there out there. It'll also do things like search for evidence of code injection. If you're running it on a live system, it'll even do digital signature checks. So it will go and verify the digital signatures of all the executables that have been loaded into memory. And finally, it will do what we call kind of least frequency of occurrence checking. It will look at how many uh, occurrences of each DLL uh, have been loaded. And if it's a very low count, that could indicate that they're a little bit anomalous or it may not be something you want to trust. We'll talk a little more about least frequency of occurrence uh, shortly here. So let's see another example. This is an example of uh, a piece of malware that's commonly used by someone like the APT or an advanced attacker. And instead of really being uh, incredibly advanced from a standpoint of how it hides itself in the file system, it actually takes a very, uh, a very rudimentary approach. Uh, which turns out to be very effective in 99 out of 100 cases. And that's the idea of hiding in plain sight. The idea of uh, trying to name itself and keep all those factors we've talked about so far uh, as similar to the original as possible so that an instant responder just easily glosses over it. So here is our process list for this piece of malware. Now, does anyone actually see kind of what looks malicious in here? I'll be honest, I, I actually didn't catch it the first time I was reviewing this, uh, this memory image. I kind of blew right by it. Yeah, you see something that says .exe uh, with all caps. Uh, that actually uh, turns out to be legit. Looks like Justin, Justin has nailed it. It's right there. It's actually not SVC host. And one of the reasons why attackers love SPC hosts is because there's usually about four to six of them running on any given system. So it's really easy just to add a, another one in and it kind of just blends in. But in this case, the attackers actually, instead of naming it SPC host, which the real name is, they just transpose the two letters. So we're seeing this SPC host uh, .exe. And here's our particulars related to it. And I was looking at this, once I went through all the processes, I, I didn't see anything that, that, that jumped out at me. And then I said, well, since I know attackers often will use SBC hosts, let me at least look at each one of those. So I, I kind of went down the road on each one. And when I got to this one, I did identify that, that something was off. For instance, look at the parent. The parent is explore.exe. 
Now that is a dead giveaway that something was run under kind of a user context. So explore.exe is a GUI. So you, you wouldn't expect to see a system process typically run uh, with a parent of explore.exe. Its parent process path is also C Windows, which is uh, kind of interesting. Well, actually, that's not interesting at all because that's where explore.exe runs. But, it's, uh, but it was actually its an application path is system32. So that fits. That makes sense. And then, of course, we see the security identifier is under kind of a user context, uh, which uh, we typically wouldn't expect to see on a standard SPC host process. So I looked at all those, and I swear I still didn't catch it. <laughs> I was still looking at it. I was like, I know this one's bad. I just don't know why. And I was thinking about things like, well, OK, so SPC host, we know it's in system 32. Uh, maybe you know, they did some sort of uh, replacement of, of the original VLL, you know, trying to maybe circumventing Windows file uh, protection, or, you know, which we all know is relatively trivial to do. But then I was thinking, you know, that would, that would almost certainly make the, the system very unstable because service host.exe is such an important process for so many things. So I've still beaten my head around, and we'll see actually shortly here how I found it. But the, the moral of the story is there's actually always more than one way to find things. Justin found it immediately. <laughs> Dyslexic hackers unite. I like that. <laughs> but, uh, but absolutely. But one of the things that I really like uh, or try to always make for myself when I'm doing forensics is a backup plan. I never want to have to get perfect every, every time I iterate over kind of a review. I always want to have enough processes and enough checks in place that if I miss something the first time, I actually catch it uh, with some other tool or some other kind of technique. And we'll see what technique I use in a very shortly here. So here's the various things that, uh, that I kind of found uh, as interesting. You can't tell from, from this, but actually the start time of the service host or this SDC host.exe process was different than the rest of the service host.exe. So that means that it actually started after them. And very commonly, one of the things that you'll see, you'll be able to tell, is whether the process started at boot or whether it started after boot. And you can tell that because you'll see a large number of processes all started near the same time, and the rest kind of started in incremental times after that. And as such, this one happened to not start at boot. It started sometime after the initial boot, which is another red flag that something was up. So another way that we could have found that is by looking at it visually. Now we have a way in Redline to view hierarchical processes. And if we look at this, we'll see everything running under services.exe, including all of the legitimate service host processes. Look where our SCV host.exe process is run. Look at this way, it's very much of an outlier. Something doesn't fit. And these should be the things you're kind of looking for. The ones that just, hmm, why the heck isn't that SPC host process with the other ones? Well, in this case, it's because it's not named SPC host, and it was actually spawned under a user context under explore.exe. But in this case, the hierarchical view uh, shows you that. And we'll see that volatility has a means to do this, as well as HP Gary's responder tool actually added this capability in November of last year. So most of the tools that we cover, well, actually all of the tools we'll cover uh, in this presentation, actually now have this capability to view things hierarchically. So kind of a neat way to very quickly look for anomalies. So it turns out that while processes are really important, they're just one little sliver uh, of information available. There are a heck of a lot, in some cases thousands, of other pieces of the puzzle that are all part of an individual process. So we have that big executive process structure. It's going to have pointers to things like our loaded libraries, things to like handles, which you can think of as pointers to system resources, maybe files or registry uh, uh, keys or values. We may also see things like mutexes. Mutexes and semaphores are used by processes in order to uh, maintain unique access to a resource to make sure that they don't compete uh, uh, for, for a resource that maybe can only be used sequentially. What malware often uses it for is a means to mark its territory. We'll see that malware commonly will set a mutex so that once it compromises the system, if another piece of malware, like another, uh, another kind of similar worm, tries to 
compromise the system again, it will first check for that mutex. If the mutex, or it's also called mutants, if the mutex or mutant is not uh, is on the system, it will just silently die, making sure that it doesn't re repeatedly compromise the same system, taking up too many resources and eventually causing it to maybe crash. This is the old problem that you remember way back to the Morris worm that it had. And then the final thing we might look for is things like network sockets. Network sockets are interesting enough tied to indiv individual processes. And we'll be able to leverage that uh, to view what, what kind of network activity a process is doing. So let's go back to that so big memory image. You remember that it redlined that winptr32.exe? We saw it was running from the Windows directory, it had a user security identifier related to it. The reason why that malware risk index was rated 100 by Redline is this. It turns out that Redline recognized a couple of commonly known mutants for that piece of malware. Now, taking a look at these, you're probably looking and saying, hmm, I don't think I would have recognized those. And, and I'll be honest, I wouldn't have recognized those. Uh, that so big is uh, a little, well, I think it's 2008-ish. Um, so I, I haven't seen so big in a long time. And I certainly wouldn't have been up to date on what the, what the individual mutant was for that. However, the great thing about this tool is it has some built-in heuristics. So I didn't have to memorize what the mutant is for so but it actually found it for me. In this case, I got lucky. It found it, said it was a uh, malware risk index of 100, and made it very clear that I should focus my efforts on this process instead of any of the other 40 or 50 processes uh, that were on that system. Looking at a different piece of malware, Configur. So again, running Redline on Configur, we get a malware risk index of 100. You'll notice that the rest of the process details are actually legit. This, is, this process is legitimately called service host.exe. It's running from the system32 directory where, where we would expect. It's parent of services.exe. It was actually started at the correct time. So everything's legit about this. Even the, the security identifier, you'll notice, uh, looks uh, like a system security identifier, not like a user context based SID. The reason why everything looks legit is everything is legit. In this case, Configure injected itself into a legitimate service host.exe process, in effect camouflaging itself. However, Redline identified a couple of mutants uh, that were well known for Configure and then elevated the malware risk index in that case. Now again, I, I can't say that I would have uh, visually recognized those mutants myself. Here, here is the output of opening up that service host.exe process and looking at the specific mutants that are tied to that process. Now, while I wouldn't necessarily maybe recognize those mutants, one of the things that really is nice about Redline and also Memorize when we get to it is it has something called this least frequency of occurrence. Most of your elements or struct memory structures that you'll see within this tool can be sorted by their level of occurrence, or how many times they are referenced throughout the memory image. Ones that are referenced very few times tend to be more likely to be malicious. The idea goes all the way back to what we call the rootkit paradox, which is the idea that malware wants to run, but it, <laughs> but it also really wants to hide. And also the fact that malware should be the least common thing on your system. By definition, malware should be anomalous. As such, things that it relies upon, especially kind of mutants or maybe specific registry keys it's added or drivers, those should really only be referenced by the malware and by nothing else. As such, their occurrence rate should be much, much smaller. So in this case, there were about six very smallly referenced mutants. Three of those six turn out to be evil mutants related to Configure. Those two that Redline found, and then that third is actually a randomly generated mutant that's based on the process ID that Configure just uh, creates on the fly. So actually three out of those six mutants were actually bad. So just focusing on those 
maybe grabbing one, doing a uh, Google search, might have led us also to configure, even if the initial signatures weren't built in. And that's important because I don't want my memory analysis to only rely upon signatures. Because as we know from the, the antivirus uh, kind of problem, if you're only signature based, uh, you're actually going to be missing a heck of a lot. So having techniques like LFO to go through these sometimes thousands of, of pieces of a process and sort them by order of occurrence and then look, looking at just or focusing on the ones that actually occur the least, actually is a very, very powerful concept. So that leads me to the next tool I wanted to introduce to you, Memorize. Now, Memorize is essentially the same as Redline. They both use the same back-end analysis engine. The, uh, they just have two different kind of GUI interfaces. So Memorize was the original uh, kind of free GUI memory analysis tool. Uh, it's unclear whether Mandiant is going to continue to support both or if they're going to move all the development into Redline. Yeah. But in effect, they have the same analysis engine. They just have two different front ends. So Redline is the newer of the two, and I think it has a, a much more kind of understandable uh, front end. The front end to memorize is something called Audit Viewer. So you actually have two pieces when you, when you go to download Memorize. You need to get Memorize and Audit Viewer in order, to, in order to use it. It also has the malware rating index. It also has the least frequency of occurrence. So essentially the same idea, uh, just a little different way of looking at it. And it's actually, uh, was actually more built for uh, reverse engineers. It was kind of the team was led by a guy named Jamie Butler and uh, Peter Silverman, two extremely smart guys uh, who, have, uh, who are really kind of uh, legends in the field of, of memory analysis. And I think this first, like at least memorized to me, uh, you could really see it was, it was a tool that they made for themselves. They made for people that are really understand the, the kind of internals uh, of what's happening uh, in memory. And then Redline was a subsequent effort that said, well, hey, let's, uh, <laughs> let's open this up to kind of the mere mortals out there and give them a, a, a little more uh, kind of uh, usable interface, at least in my opinion. So here's what Memorize looks like. And this is getting back to how I actually found that scvhost.exe. So I was scratching my head. I knew there was something wrong with it. I just didn't know quite what it was. So what I did is I started to go through the handles. And, if, and I got to the loaded DLLs section for that process, and I saw this. So I sorted by occurrence, and I saw this. And again, I still didn't put it together that it was named SCV host. I still, my eyes just still saw it as SCC host. <laughs> but I started looking a little more, and I said, well, if it is actually SCC host, there should be much, much more, uh, many more occurrences than a single occurrence. I should expect this to be occurring 50 or more times. The service host is all over uh, an, op uh, an operating system. So the fact that there was only one occurrence made me look even deeper, and they finally got the big slap in the back of the head, said, oh my god, it's actually misspelled, um, as you guys uh, picked up pretty early in the game. This is a great example of us layering this idea of, of, uh, of kind of options. I don't have to be perfect. I just have to continue to kind of work through my process, and even if I miss it in the process list, something like the least frequency of occurrence, or my heuristics, or my own signatures uh, may be the key that unlocks it for me. So then getting into network artifacts. So as we said, network artifacts or sockets are actually tied to processes. These for a long time have been uh, a big part of incident response. We can often get, uh, get some very valuable information by looking at what network connections have been going on. If you think about it, similar to malware wants to run and wants to hide, malware also wants to communicate. It often doesn't do malware much good to compromise a system if it can't link back to its attackers or its command and control server. So as such, we usually get uh, very lucky at finding network-based artifacts. One of the great things about memory analysis is that we, we're not only going to find evidence potentially of, of the current network connections that were happening when we took the memory image, you can find evidence of residue of old network connections that are just being literally marked as unallocated and are floating around in memory, but our memory, not, our memory tools are smart enough to search for those and pull those out. So when we find network artifacts, what we're really looking for uh, are, again, anything anomalies. We're looking for strange ports, 
just like we used to with the idea of looking for anything that's communicating on a strange port or maybe listening at a port that would indicate maybe uh, some sort of a back door. Uh, certainly identifying things like uh, the IP addresses or domain that these connections are going to. Are they going outside of your network? Should they be? Are they going to things like known blacklisted IPs? I can't tell you how many IPs I've thrown into Google uh, from a memory analysis engine and, and seen immediately that they link back to something that's been, say, blacklisted by Conficker or tying back to, I don't know, something like the Stormworm. Then I already have a nice kind of <laughs> piece of information that tells me probably what my malware really is on this system before I even get to that point. The other key thing is that uh, while identifying backdoors are great, commonly what we're seeing now in, in more modern malware is uh, most malware I've seen is beaking it out now. It doesn't really open up a, a port to listen. It typically will be beaking out to the command and control servers, mainly to uh, evade things like ingress filtering and to look like a legitimate uh, process going out on port 80 or SSL, for instance. So that's why looking for uh, these old processes or, or network sockets that are sitting out there, we may identify that beacon out to the command and control center. And then finally, should this process really even be communicating? Sometimes you'll see a, a process, I don't know, like services.exe or lsas.exe that's actually communicating with the network socket open. Well, that should be a big red flag that that shouldn't be an issue. So if we look at these, uh, this network listing here, this is actually Metasploit. This was a interpreter module. Uh, those of you that, that have dealt with Metasploit know that it is designed to be extremely silent. Um, there, there are very few clues that an interpreter gives us uh, when running on a system. Uh, but one of the really interesting things is that we just got lucky and one of the network connections uh, for that interpreter process actually identified it. And you see that there's a port 4444, uh, which uh, should be kind of a clue <laughs> of something that, that looks a little strange. And it turned out that that was tied to a service host.exe process that process ID 1012 that had been injected in uh, with the interpreter. So even the most kind of stealthy of malware can sometimes be undone uh, by things like network artifacts. And that kind of leads us to our next tool, which is the idea of uh, HP Gary Responder. So Responder is a commercial product that HP Gary's had for a long time. They recently, I think about nine months ago, released a community edition. It, it's a GUI tool. It's a, it's a nice, pretty interface. It, it's obviously not as fully featured as their, uh, as their commercial tool. For instance, it doesn't have their digital DNA, which has a lot of built-in kind of heuristics and signatures. Now, it has some interesting things. We'll see that it'll automatically try to recover URLs of domains as well as username and passwords, uh, and even memory map files, like images or documents that relate to a process. Uh, which is kind of a, a neat feature. It does have a big limitation that it, it will only work on images at six gigs or less. So just be aware of that. And the link for this tool is here. So let's look at HP Gary. Uh, and in particular, I want to look at Zbot or Zeus. So Zeus is an interesting piece of malware. It is not stealthy by any stretch, although uh, if you're looking at it from just the system perspective as a user, you, you'll probably never have an idea it's running. Uh, but in a memory image, man, Zeus sticks out like a sore thumb. So looking at the network artifacts, we see that uh, a strange port, maybe 29220, is in a commonly seen port. Could be completely legit, maybe not. Since it's tied to an SVC host.exe process, that kind of uh, makes me look a little deeper into it because I know that often malware will want to play or, or kind of utilize SPC host to, to camouflage itself. I looked at the, the internet history um, for this process and found the following. You see kind of the highlighted uh, items. For instance, saw an interesting IP uh, that was embedded uh, within that process. What really got me was this idea of the 75.bro. I wasn't quite sure what that was. We also see maybe some banking site information. Now, Zeus is a credential stealer and or kind of banking uh, site Trojan, so that makes sense. If you do a search on either 75.bro or that IP address, 
Uh, it ties back to Zeus almost immediately. So that was a really neat indicator uh, that helps me very quickly figure out what was up with the system. For that same image, though, I, one thing I like to point out is that uh, these tools, while they kind of do the same thing, they're all coded differently. So if it's an important case, you're just not finding something, consider actually running the same image through multiple tools. Some of them do, well, all of them kind of have their kind of pros and cons, or what they do best. Now, for instance, I find that the volatility project, it's network scanning or network socket scanning, is, uh, is probably the, the best of breed. And as such, I ran the same image through volatility, and it actually came up with some old connections. In fact, we actually see the connections to that IP address, and we actually see the port they're going out to. So we've got service host.exe beaconing out to a foreign IP at port 80. Hmm. That is a classic indicator of uh, kind of an outbound beacon of a, of a command and control server. And we don't get that with any of the other tools. Actually, Volatility was the only one that found that for this particular memory image, which is kind of interesting. So now I want to get into code injection. Now, code injection is, is interesting in that uh, the most advanced malware out there uh, is commonly using uh, code injection. It's, it's, we're seeing it everywhere. And it's an incredibly uh, simple, really, and uh, effective way of cloaking uh, malware from the file system perspective. But interesting enough, while it's probably one of the more effective methods from a file system or from a user perspective, it's actually um, incredibly easy to find code injection from a memory image. So the way DL injection works is we see a couple of, uh, of Windows uh, API functions there. You know, commonly uh, something with administrator or and more importantly the set debug privilege within Windows will go out uh, target a specific process, will allocate space within that process, load its malicious payload in there, commonly something like a DLL, and then run it. And it runs under the context of whatever process it was injected into. Very nicely kind of hiding under a running process. So you run a process list on a running system, you don't see anything out of the ordinary. You don't see that winppr32.exe that we saw with the so big worm. An alternative to DLL injection is something called process hollowing. With the way this works is that the malware starts a new process, hollows it out or carves out whatever code was part of that original process, and then just stuffs its code in. So it's using kind of the, uh, the overall process kind of container to run new malicious code. The good news is that um, there are techniques that have been developed out there that, that make code injection really easy to detect. And all of these tools that we'll talk about have the ability to, uh, to kind of search for it and to identify it. And really the way they're doing it is they're looking for memory pages that belong to a process but are unnamed and marked as uh, read, well, executable or very commonly read-write executable, which is kind of an uncommon thing for a memory page. And then the final thing you can look for in these pages is to take a look within them and see if they contain something like a DLL or an executable. So let's see, so I think Justin asked, how does um, interpreters migrate injected stuff into another process? Uh, well, very simply what it does is it, uh, it either uh, uses an exploit or does something like privilege ex escalation in order to get admin privileges. Once you, get ad once you have admin privileges on a system, uh, injecting yourself into any process uh, is, is fairly trivial. So then it's literally just pick the process you want, go through the process I just described, and now the interpreter is running directly within that process. So let's look again at Zeus. So Zeus does a ton of DLL injection. So here is one variant of Zeus. Not all, as you know, there are a lot of variances of all these malware, but one variant of Zeus will copy itself to a specific, direct, uh, a specific file within the System32 directory. It will not only inject one process, it injects almost every process. Then it creates an auto-run path or, uh, or entry in order to maintain persistence against reboots. It creates some additional directories to throw some of its files in. It has a very well-known mutant that we could look for, and it does a ton of hooking. Uh, it is very much of kind of a, uh, <laughs> a very busy uh, piece of malware. 
And of course, SUSE is, as we've mentioned before, is a credential stealer. It's looking for everything from protected storage to certificates you have on the system to, uh, to any uh, passwords and usernames uh, used in the system. Um, and it is uh, extremely effective and extremely pervasive out there. So let's imagine that you're looking at a computer. You think it might be infected with Zeus. You're not quite sure, but you decide to grab a memory image and load it into Redline. Now, as you see, uh, the pro tip, Memorize uh, has something really interesting. Any process that sees that, it, that it is likely injected will actually be shown in red. Hmm, I wonder if this computer is actually infected. Right. <laughs> Interestingly enough, also SpyEye, if you're familiar with that, SpyEye does, uh, does um, much of the same kind of uh, techniques. It injects into just about every uh, running process uh, available. So this is uh, a, a, an obvious, I don't know, the real question here is, man, where do we start? It looks like every single process is injected. And we might start up at that SBC host.exe, because as you see, that actually has a number next to it. That's the malware rating index. So that is the item or the process that Memorize believes is probably uh, the most malicious. And we could look within there and we can actually see the memory section. We could also just uh, export out that process in all its memory sections and start to do our analysis uh, from that perspective. So Memorize makes it incredibly easy. How about Stuxnet? I think everyone's probably familiar with Stuxnet. Stuxnet is, uh, is largely thought to be one of the most uh, uh, advanced pieces of malware we see in the wild. It was the malware thought to be targeting the Iranian nuclear reactors. So here's an image uh, with running Stuxnet, Stuxnet, and this is actually the HP Gary product. And looking at it, you may see something anomalous. We see actually three LSS.exe processes running. Anybody want to guess which, which one is the legit and which ones aren't? To be honest, at this point, it would be a complete yes. Uh, you could guess the lowest PID, and that is actually the case here, but that's not always the case. So it turns out that these two processes are the illegitimate ones. These were the ones that were in, in, installed or initiated by Stuxnet, hollowed out, and then its code was actually placed within there. And as you can see, our memory analysis tools quickly show uh, this kind of anomaly. One way we can tell whether uh, which ones are illegitimate or not is if we look at kind of the additional information about the process. So for instance, the loaded DLLs of the legitimate one we see here on the left and of the illegitimate. You notice that there's much fewer actually loaded DLLs on the, uh, the, the malicious LSAS process. You also might notice this. One of the DLLs actually doesn't even have a name. It's what we call an unnamed memory section. This is a name that just uh, HP Gary's product uh, gave it. So just it's a memory, it looks like it has a PE uh, file in or portable executable, and it's at this address. So that's a great example of an unnamed memory page that's sitting out there tied to a process, which uh, is almost certainly malicious. So one of the most advanced pieces of malware in the world, and we found it in, I don't know, maybe a minute or two. Which leads me to the final uh, tool I wanted to introduce, volatility. Uh, volatility is probably my favorite uh, of all the tools. I think Redline is a fantastic tool uh, for everyday analysis. But when I'm getting down to kind of hardcore analysis, uh, nothing has the flexibility of volatility. It's a open source based framework. As such, there's a wealth of different plugins uh, for the, the framework. Up until very recently, it only worked on XP systems. Uh, with the new version that's now been expanded to a wide range of, of Windows uh, related systems. Uh, one of the only uh, drawbacks of volatility right now is that it only currently has 32 bit support. Now, 64 bit support is in beta. They'll probably be out by the summer, I suspect. Uh, but just keep in mind that if you have 64 bit systems, uh, you won't be able to run volatility on them, unfortunately. Now, if you want to play with volatility and you don't want to go through the process of uh, installing and configuring it, keep in mind that the SAMS SIFT workstation, you can download it freely from the SAMS uh, computer forensics site, actually has it kind of preloaded uh, with a lot of the, the most popular plugins. So the only downside of volatility 
is that it, it's a little, it has a little bit of a learning curve. It's not GUI based. You have to kind of understand uh, what the plugins do, and you have to have a little more knowledge of what's happening behind the scenes or what those uh, memory structures and, and, uh, and items actually are and how they interoperate. Once you get there, it is a fantastic tool. My favorite plugin for volatility is called Malfine. It's actually written by uh, Michael Hell Lai, who wrote, also wrote the Malware Analyst Cookbook. Fantastic tool. It essentially goes and tries to detect code injection. So running this on Stuxnet, you see the command line at the top. It immediately finds those two LTAS processes that we saw before. And you'll notice that they are page execute read write. If you look on the, the right side of each process, you also see how it tries to uh, give us a little bit more information exactly what's in that process. Those of you that are uh, are used to doing file signature analysis on this, you'll notice that MZ header is the, the file signature for portable executables. As such, it looks like this is a page that is unnamed, is part of a uh, running process, and has a loaded, it was marked as executable, and has a loaded uh, DLL or portable executable file within it. All uh, very uh, strong factors indicating that it's malicious. The other cool thing that Malfine does is it dumps them out, and you can see the uh, the location, the dumps to location. So then we have these to actually take a, a deeper look into, to run strings on, or maybe to upload to something like Virus Total, or to run against our own antivirus product. Interesting enough, that Stuxnet, Stuxnet's been along for a long time, and I was shocked when I ran it against uh, Virus Total. Only two out of 43 <laughs> antivirus vendors actually found it. And if you look at that Komodo entry, the reason why Komodo found it wasn't because it was necessarily Stuxnet. It was because that the uh, executable that was in that memory page actually was packed with UPX, which is a commonly used packer for malware. Can't explain why. I, I expect they're getting better and better each month, but this just shows you that uh, memory analysis can often find things that things like our traditional uh, defensive techniques may not immediately. So putting it all together, we have kind of all these items that I talked about. I know I'm going kind of rapid, uh, rapid fire here. Uh, we only have an hour. I'm trying to stick as much as possible to that hour. Uh, but the bottom line is, how do we actually kind of put it all together? And the way I've gone through this, uh, this presentation is kind of going through the steps in the order that I would typically look. The first thing you do is you identify processes and review them. Uh, that's a gimme. If you find something that's anomalous just based on the, the process parent ID, or the process name, or the process command line. Well, hey, well that's the easy way to find it. The next step might be look deeper into any processes uh, that you just aren't sure about. Reviewing things like their loaded DLLs or their handles. Of course, the problem with this is that there could be a thousand or more of those. And uh, a lot of them aren't recognizable uh, to the average mere mortal. But doing things like digital signature checks, uh, they're built into uh, Redline and Memorize uh, when you run on a live system can be helpful. Also, least frequency of occurrence is, I think, a lifesaver with these. And that's why I like those, uh, those manual tools so much, is because they have that capability. They're the only ones that have the ability to do LFO kind of out of the box. Next step I would do is something like uh, looking for evidence of code injection. So we saw how that works and how, uh, how powerful that can be. Then look for network connections or ports, looking for anything anomalous, maybe also looking for uh, strings within the processes for any uh, HTTP or FTP uh, connections uh, or any type of IP or domain name that we can do. Sometimes you can use things like regular expressions to do that or you saw that the HP Gary tool would automatically pull that information out. Then I would look for signs of hooking. Um, now, we don't have enough time to cover hooking. You'll notice that there is a bonus section at the end of my slide uh, that cover kind of how these tools actually identify hooking. But hooking is uh, very common to rootkits and is also uh, relatively easy to identify using um, memory analysis. To be honest, it's the easiest way to identify uh, rootkits is by identifying kind of what they have hooked on a system. And then finally, you probably have a series of processes. If, if in fact, this system we're looking at is, in fact, um, intruded upon or has malware, you probably have one or more processes that you're, not, you're still believe may be malicious, the final step is to 
export them out. One of the great things about these tools is you can literally just export out the entire process or individual memory sections and then continue to do our analysis. So them to AV, run strings against them, or, uh, or eventually pass them to someone like a reverse engineer or maybe your reverse engineer and put them into something like a disassembler and try to review the code and identify what it's doing. So there are some resources that I want you to be aware of. This is definitely a Windows uh, Memory Analysis 101 class. So I've tried to keep it at a high level. But also I wanted you to realize, uh, kind of as, as Chris is saying, that this idea that it really is, uh, is nothing to fear. <laughs> it really is getting to the point where uh, for much of the, uh, the malware you're likely to come into, uh, if you get a good memory sample, you have a pretty darn good chance of finding it. If you want to learn more, uh, I can't say enough about that Malware Analyst Cookbook. It's the best book I've read in the last couple of years. I think it should be on everyone's shelf. It's fantastic. It actually has a quarter of the book just related to uh, memory analysis, specifically volatility memory analysis. So if you want to learn volatility, it's probably the best book available. Jamie Butler and Greg Hoagland. Jamie Butler actually uh, was involved with Redline and Memorize. Greg Hoagland, of course, with HP Gary and the uh, Responder product. They wrote a book on rootkits, uh, which is a great one if you're interested in, in those kind of more advanced malware. And then the Windows Internals book is, is a must-have uh, when you're trying to learn uh, kind of what all of these things like executive process blocks are and process environment blocks and all the things that I glossed over uh, due to time in this investigation. Oh, I'm sorry, in this <laughs> presentation. And then finally, if you're familiar with the SANS courses, we have uh, a pretty robust curriculum. Our 408, 508, and 610 courses all cover different elements of memory analysis at their corresponding level. So if you're taking one of those, you have taken one of those, you probably know about that. Here are some links. I won't leave this up for too long because I'm pretty much out of time, but get that PDF. These links are fantastic uh, for um, really uh, getting your, your feet wet in memory analysis. Uh, many of them go through step by step uh, how uh, a given memory sample was analyzed. Also, the, the tools, the Memorize uh, and HP Gary tools, as well as Redline, all have good user manuals. So don't forget to look at the user manuals. This can be very helpful. And then Volatility has a great wiki if you look at the, the bottom reference there under the code.google.com uh, link. And as Mr. Barker mentions, we do have some classes coming up. There is the Forensic 508 is going to be offered as a, uh, a mentor-based course out of Sydney. So if you're in that area, definitely look that up. We'll be teaching 408 in Singapore in March and then in Brisbane uh, in the May time frame. So we're starting to kind of ramp up our, uh, our Forensic curriculum in Asia Pacific. Love to see you at one of the courses. Of course, if you have any, uh, if you have any questions uh, about this presentation or about the classes, I'd love to, uh, to answer them for you. Uh, Here's my email address. Don't forget that we have the bonus section. And I'll, I'll stick around for questions. I realize that some of you uh, I've been told are on your lunch breaks. Uh, lucky you. I'm about to go to bed. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'll stick around for some questions. I did see one question that I, I didn't forget. Uh, it was actually asked by Jess. And he, and he, he asked, said, you mentioned rootkits and hiding. Is it possible for malware rootkit to affect a memory dump? How trustworthy is a live memory dump on a compromised box? And uh, my answer to that is that a, a live memory dump is typically pretty trustworthy. There is, uh, you know, everything in our field is measure countermeasure. And so every time we get an edge, and I think very much in the memory analysis part, we have an edge right now. These tools give us a distinct edge over malware creators. However, there has been research, and there is a proof of concept for a technique that would be effective potentially against taking a memory dump. Uh, if you're interested, it's called Shadow Walker. What it does is something pretty clever. It monitors, pro it monitors processes in memory. And if it sees a process sequentially accessing memory, it will assume that that is probably a memory dumping tool and will try to page itself out. So it'll, it'll page out the malware, most of the malware, to the page file, hoping to actually evade that live uh, memory dump. Now, I don't, know, uh, I don't know of any malware in the wild that's been discovered. In fact, unless there's, uh, unless there's something running around uh, that's very custom, I, I doubt that there is anything, uh, at least that we're aware of, uh, that, that currently does this. But it is something to think about. And while I didn't have time to cover it here,
there is a new kind of, I'd say, the cutting edge of, of forensics. And that's this idea of live memory analysis. And I did mention it. This idea that uh, typically when we think of memory analysis, we think of running it against a static memory image that we took from a system, we then put on a thumb drive, bring over to our friends at workstation. However, a better and more robust way is to actually do your memory audit on the system that's running. The reason why is that you get access to the page file, uh, among other things. You can also do things like digital signature checks that you can't do from a dead uh, memory image. And you have a better chance of your heuristics uh, and, and signatures actually catching something. So that's uh, a, a little bit, uh, well, very much on the cutting edge. I think people are still going to have to get really used to that. The best tool for doing live memory analysis is Redline. And um, I actually have a, a post up on my blog at forensicmethods.com. If you do a search on Redline, on there you'll see that there's a post on the pros and, and really there's not very many cons uh, to doing live memory analysis. And that's where I see things moving. And that has a, um, a very good chance of defeating kind of that shadow walker technique of paging out because it's also taking into account the page file, uh, which can, can be very useful. And I think I answered the question about what tools would do the live memory analysis. The only tool, two that I know of are Redline and Memorize. Redline has a really neat feature. You can dump your Redline to a thumb drive, run it on the command line so you have a, a much smaller footprint on the system. And it will actually do not only a memory audit, but it will also do a memory image. So you get the best of both worlds. You get like a complete memory audit as well as the memory image. Then you come back and import your memory audit back into Redline. And you can do your analysis then offline. And, it, and it's a, a much more robust way of, of going about. That's where I see a lot of research moving. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate uh, you all coming. This is a, a great showing. As I said, I'm excited. I'll, it won't be, I guess, it's a little, uh, just a few weeks, and I'll actually be in Singapore, so I'll be kind of nearby. If you're in Singapore, I'll be giving this presentation uh, live, actually, in Singapore at an HTCI event that's tied to the, uh, the SANS event. So if you're in Singapore, uh, hit me up and I'll, uh, I'll give you the details. It's also on my blog. And uh, I'd love to kind of meet you in person. And again, thanks to AISA for getting the word out. And uh, thanks to you all for taking the time. So find the bad guys. <laughs>